For those of you that know me, you know I'm already an emotional guy. And already before the sermon started, I've already been in tears because of Brother John being here. So I'm already kind of starting off in a bad way. But Diane, thanks for, for playing that. Nothing compares to the promise that we have in Christ. So when we think about the emotional entanglement we have when people utter words, when people say words like, I will, what's the message that we get? When a politician says, if you elect me, I will do X, what's the message that they're sending? Elect me. I want to be a leader. So let's stand and let's look at Numbers 30. Chapter, one, or chapter 30, verses 1 and 2. And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Let's go to the Father in prayer. Father, thank you for the breath that you have given me to sing your praises, to shout your joy. Father, thank you for the blessings that you pour over us every single day, the blessings that we don't even acknowledge you for. Father, I pray that you would bless the words that come out of my mouth. Prepare my heart to say them, but prepare the congregation to hear them. Father, I'm resting in your promise that your word shall not proceed out and return unto you void. Use your word to fulfill and to further your promise and to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, we're going to start off with a question. The Lord commanded Moses that if a man makes a vow before God, then that vow is bound to his soul. He shall not break his word, and he shall do everything that proceeds out of his mouth. The question here is, does God have a double standard? Does God create rules for thee, but not for me? Does God say, thou shalt do, but I won't do? Does God create a standard for us as his creation that he does not hold himself to? The answer is no. God does not create rules that he does not also follow. He is sovereign, he is just, and he is righteous. And his holiness will not allow that. So I want, we can take such comfort or such fear when God says, I will and I have spoken. Because he will do what he says he will do when he says he will do it. What kind of message is sent when someone says, I will? A ministry need comes up. Somebody says, I will take care of it. What's the expectation that's going to get done? When a boss says, I'll let you take Thursday off to take care of something, what's the expectation? We can expect that when somebody says these two words, I will, that whatever it is that follows will get accomplished. The task will be done. Now, whether or not we trust the person, making that I will statement is predicated on two things. The first one is, are they trustworthy or untrustworthy? If the person says, I will take care of it, but they've demonstrated a lack of ability or a lack of care to take care of what they said they would, we can no longer trust their I will statement. We can no longer trust that that promise is true. But also the motivation behind the I will statement. Is the I will statement, is the motivation, is it... To make themselves look good? Is it to accomplish the mission? Is it to do what God said to do? 
What's, what's behind the I will? In the case of the politician, the, the motive behind it is to get elected. But what should our expectation be when God says, I will? We should expect that it should happen even more than we expect fallen man to do what they said they would do. We can trust with confidence that God will. It may not happen in our time, but it's going to happen in his time. And when God says, I will, there are no ifs, ands, or buts, or exceptions to policy. It will happen. God will do what he says he will do. Why can we trust God? Because he's done everything he said he would do. Without faltering, without failure, without, I intended to do that, but God's delivered every time. In the Gospels, Matthew through John, there are over 130 times Jesus says, I will. And we're going to walk through all of them in the next three days. (laughs) I've chosen seven of them that we're going to walk through today. What has Jesus said that are attached with the vow that he shall not break? He shall not break his word. And he shall do according to all that has proceeded out of his mouth. The first I will we're going to look at. I will save. Let's look at John chapter 6, verses 35 through 37. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, that ye also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father has given me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. How many times have we heard that someone will come to church, they'll come to Christ when they get their lives together, when they get their act together, and then when they make themselves righteous, they'll come to church. How many people have we encountered that felt that they were not good enough for salvation? Isn't that the point? None of us are good enough for salvation. None of us are worthy of the blood that it took to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yet, we have a vow of Jesus. To whoever shall come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Can we believe that I will statement? When Jesus came and was born of Mary, he had one job. And it was to seek and to save the lost. He left heaven to come into this world. He left the throne of God to save sinners and to give his blood for our redemption. See, Jesus didn't come to spend time with those that they thought they were just or those that were self-righteous. In fact, he had some very scolding things to say to those people. You brood of vipers. When talking to a man named Zacchaeus, Jesus had this to say. Let's look at it in Luke 19, verses 9 and 10. It says, And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. For as much as he also is a son of Abraham, number 10, for the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which was lost. Jesus tells us what his purpose is. Again and again, Jesus tells us that his purpose, his only purpose to coming to earth was to seek and save the lost. Let's look back at John three sixteen through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18. He that believeth on him shall not be condemned. 
but he that is not condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. If you believe in God, there's no more condemnation. But if you don't believe, you're condemned already. He gave his blood to those lost in sin. And in effect, he said that his blood will give us access to the very throne of God. How great and awesome is Jesus' vow to save even me. And as I will continue to say, God's vow is irrevocable. God will do what proceeds out of his mouth. And he has promised with this vow to save us. The next vow we're going to look at is the vow, I will cleanse. Let's look at Luke chapter 5 and verse 12 and 13. And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, he beheld a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt... Thou canst make me clean. 5.13 And he put forth his hand and touched him. Jesus reached out and touched the man, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. We're lost in sin. We need Jesus to come down and reach us and touch us. And when we beg, please... Wipe my sin clean, I will be thou clean. And when God touches us, when Jesus touches us, immediately our sin departs. How many of us need to be cleansed from sin? I know I do. See, leprosy is a disease that infects every single part of our body much like sin does to our spiritual bodies. If we come to the Lord and say we are full of whatever unclean habits and ask Him to cleanse us, we should be clean. He's promised, He's vowed that He will cleanse us. An encounter with Jesus is transformational. We see that all through the Gospels. But don't we see it today? How many times have I heard, I have been an abuser to my family, both physically and mentally, but then I met Jesus and I no longer do those things. I was lost in addiction to whatever the substance was, but in my stupor, somebody presented me the gospel, I turned to Jesus and I'm no longer addicted to that garbage. How many times does Jesus reach down and touch people and make them whole, even today? If you claim to be cleansed by Jesus, if you say that you've been washed in the blood, as the old hymn sings, and you stay lost in sin, either you've not asked him to cleanse you from that unrighteousness, or your addiction is greater than your devotion to God. See, the same God that created everything we see from nothing, who breathed into us his breath of life, if he says, you will be clean, Will you not be clean? Will not God keep his promise? When God says, I will, he means what he says. We can hold firm to this. Because God says, Jesus says, I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God promised, God vows to cleanse us and make us whole. The next vow we see here is the I will confess. Let's look at Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 22. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him I will confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Are we ashamed of the gospel? When was the last time we bragged about the things God was doing through us and for us? When was the last time we bragged on God? See, God has done a marvelous work in us to save us and to cleanse us. 
but it's not enough. We need to get our mouths open and confess Christ here in this dark and fallen world. We are not to be ashamed of Christ. Let's look at Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation, and everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God, revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father. What does shame look like? What does it mean to be ashamed of the gospel? How many of us are willing to open our mouths at work and be chided as the religious hypocrite? How many of us are willing to share to others that are living in sin that Jesus died for your salvation? Are we ashamed of that message? Do we try to hide that message? What about when we're standing in line at a grocery store? Do people know, can people tell by the way that we act and the way that we talk that we're Christians? Or do we reserve the light, do we reserve the candle that has been burning since you were saved? Do we reserve that for here in the church? And this is the only place we let our light shine. If we try to cover it up, if we try to hide us being saved by grace, are we not ashamed? Do we not act like we're ashamed? It's like when somebody comes into a room and you know you're doing something you ought not be doing and you try to cover it up and hide what it was that you were doing. Is that how we treat our relationship with Christ? When we have been washed in the blood of Jesus, we cannot remain silent no matter how hard it gets. No matter the battle we have to fight. Let's look at another thing that Paul says. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 11 through 13. Whereunto I am appointed preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. This is Paul saying. For the which cause I shall I suffer these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast, verse 13. The form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Jesus Christ. God appointed Paul a task to do. To share the gospel among the Gentiles. What has God given our task to do? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ on mission with God, as I said last Sunday night? What is Jesus' mission? What was he put on this earth to do? To seek and to save the lost. How can we be a tool for that mission? God has given us each our own abilities. He has given us our own calling. What are we doing with it? Are we sharing the gospel where God put us? See, Paul gladly suffered everything for he was not ashamed of the gospel. He was not ashamed of Jesus our Savior. We must take a public stand on Christ. Either we are bold in confessing him before man, or we are ashamed of the work that Jesus has done. And there is no in between. There is no middle ground. It's one or the other. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. But you know, there's another verse to that. There's a part B. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. This vow is dependent on our our commitment or our lack of commitment to Christ before other people. We may say, God, we trust you. We may say, God, I love you. We may say, Jesus, I believe in you. But where do we say that? 
Do we say that amongst other people that we know won't condemn us for what we say we believe? Or do we say we believe it even with the people we know will hate us for it? See, this vow here that I will confess you before my Father, is dependent on us. What is our action? Let's get our mouths open. Let's confess Jesus before people that aren't members of this congregation. The next promise we're going to look at is I will serve. Let's look at Mark chapter 1, 17 and 18. And Jesus said unto them, Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. I will make you fishers of men. See, isn't it fitting that Jesus walked upon fishermen and gave them an analogy that would fit them? So what's your work? What are, where did Jesus find you? What were you doing when God says, I choose you, come follow me? Were you on a harvester? Come follow me and I will reap the harvest. What were you doing when God called you? I will make you fishers of men. Listen to me now. If we open our mouths and confess Jesus before other people, there is no Christian that cannot win souls for Christ. There is no Christian that cannot help but bring people to our Savior. It doesn't matter how well or not we think we may or may not evangelize. See, the work is not ours to do. See, let's look at John 12, 30 through 32. And Jesus answered this, The voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from this earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus once said to Peter, follow me. And Peter simply obeyed, leaving his nets on the ground left everything where it fell, and ran after Jesus. On the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, what was the result? I doubt Peter ever caught as many fish in one day as he did that day. I think it would have broken every net on the boat if they had to bring in 3,000 fish. Jesus said, if you come to me, I will make you fishes of men. And Jesus has been fishing for souls ever since. The devil seeks to cut the line. But we must trust in the vow Jesus made that he will draw all men. How many of us get discouraged when we share the gospel, but yet it doesn't seem like it yields any result? We don't see souls saved. Isn't this the strategy of the one that seeks to derail what God's trying to do. See, let's look at this as a period of sowing and reaping. What would we think of a farmer that spent all year running a harvester and then complaining that the harvester wasn't reaping his crops? See, there must first be a period of sowing. There must first be a period of planting. There must first be a period where God is allowed to work and to grow the individual, and then when the harvest is ripe and ready, then we may collect then the souls turn to God. To continue the fisherman analogy, we must also use the right kind of bait. This world is in need of a savior. If we are going to be successful in sharing Christ, we must share Christ crucified. Not only what he, what he did while he was alive, that's only half the story. What God did, what Jesus did while he was here and walking among us, is what people say made him a great person, is what, made him, is what people say made him a good prophet. But the other half of the story, what did he do in death? Getting back to John 12, 32, he, it is in his lifting up that he will draw all men. 
Everyone has a void that only Christ can fill. And they hunger and then the thirst for the filling of Christ. And only focusing on half of the story doesn't bait the hook. We are only saved by the blood of the Christ. By the blood of our Messiah. Not by the lepers that he healed. Not by the blind that he returned to to sight to. But by his blood. By the blood that he shed for us. And how unworthy are we for that for that price? The next I will I will comfort. Let's look at John fourteen, sixteen through eighteen. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth within you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will comfort you. See, that's, that's the fear the disciples had when Jesus was leaving was, if you leave, who's going to be with us? Who's going to minister to us in our times of need? They didn't want to let Jesus go because he comforted them. He knew exactly what to say, when to say it, and what would minister to their souls. But I must go, but when I go, I will send you my comforter. Christ has not departed and left us on our own. We have trials and temptations. I'm going to start walking down to him. Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. All we got to do is take it to the Lord in prayer. He will share in our sorrow. Jesus knows our suffering. And he's reaching out his hand to help us, to pull us through it, to be there with us. Jesus promised not to leave us orphaned. I think that's a better way to translate that. See, he didn't leave Joseph in the dungeon, did he? God was with him. When Daniel was cast down into the lion's den, what they didn't realize is they cast Almighty God in there with them. If we have Christ within us, can we do some things? No, it's all things. You're quick on that one. It's all things. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Though we are weak on our own, we are not weak when we lift our eyes to Jesus and hold on to his hand for his help. When we let go, when we look away, that's when we're weak. That's when we can't do it. Let's look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We all know this as the Great Commission. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. I'm with you sometimes. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. I am with you. Can we hold on to that promise? People abandon us. Friends that said they'd never leave left. Children leave their families and want nothing to do with them anymore. And it's a very sad moment in time when that happens. But what a friend we have in Jesus. The believer in Christ will never be separated. He's here with us now. Do you believe it? Can we trust the promise of God? Will he do the things that proceeds out of his mouth? Do we really believe what we say we believe? Are we acting as though God's vow means something? 
every single moment. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be, with, be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Jesus vowed to never leave us or forsake us. What comfort can we take in that promise? I can look back at my life and see that moment, see that promise true at every moment. May we boldly say, the Lord is with us. What then shall men do to me? Are we ashamed of the gospel? Or do we with boldness proclaim, you can't touch me? And in those moments when we think we have to fear for our lives, we have to fear for our jobs, we have to fear for our social standing, God says, I'm right here with you. Look no further than my son Jesus. Let's look at this next promise. I will resurrect. John 6, 39, 40, and 44 says this. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all of which he hath given unto me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again the last day. I should lose nothing. I'm going to pause here for just a moment. When God says, I will save you, can we be lost? I will lose nothing. What kind of a promise is this? How awesome is this promise? That we can never be lost, we can never be separated from Almighty God. And verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me to draw him. And I will raise him up the last day. I will raise him up at the last day. These are merely three of the four times in John chapter 6 that we are given the promise of the resurrection. What a blessed promise this is. Our master has conquered death and he has vowed that if we believe and confess him, we shall be raised again in glory. This promise is special because while we suffer through the things we must for the cause of Christ here on earth, He vows to be with us through it all. Never wavering. Reminds me of a time I, I read a poem about the footprints in the sand. We're all probably familiar with it. He said, you know, you can look back and see the times that there are two footprints and then you feel like you, God left you alone when there's a single set of footprints in the sand. And that's when God says, I carried you. But this, this other piece that I read said, and you see those drag marks? <laughs> Though we must suffer what we must for the cause of Christ, when our work here on earth is done, he vows to resurrect us in glory, to be with him as he is and a resurrected body, perfect, spotless, blameless, without illness. This is a blessed vow. And though none of us here has experienced this one quite yet, since Jesus has kept every single vow to this point, can we rest assured that this will take place? Jesus has kept every other vow, every other time that we've needed it. We can expect with boldness that we will be resurrected on the last day. We have cause for rejoicing when fellow believers pass on and are resurrected. 
we will be with them. We will be reunited with them again in glory. Now, it's really difficult to separate the previous vow and this one from each other. They go hand in hand so very well. The next vow, I will glorify. Let's look at John 17. We get a glimpse of a time that Jesus prayed even for us here in this room. John 17, 20 through 26. Neither pray I for these alone. This is when he's in the upper room with the twelve. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. Have we not believed on Christ because of the word of the disciples in that room with Jesus then? 21. That they may be as one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. That they, shall, that they may be also as one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. I'm going to walk through this a little bit here. God is in Christ, and Christ is in God, and they are one, and they are inseparable. They are unified. They are one body. And when we are in Christ, we are in that trio as well. That when we are one, just as Christ is one with the body, there is no greater evangelism statement than we can make than being unified in Christ and proclaiming to the world that Christ is one with God. That the world may know that thou hast sent me, that the world may know that Christ was sent by God and that God loves them as he loved me, as God loves us as God loved Christ is what that verse is saying. Verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundations of the world, that they may be with me where I am and may behold my glory. What an awesome thing that's going to be. Verse 25, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Jesus prayed for every disciple. If you believe that you've been raised from your sin, that Jesus' blood has been shed for you, then you are a disciple of Christ. This also applies to us here today. This is every disciple, from the twelve that walked with him on the shores of Galilee, to those even yet future that might not even been born yet. This prayer is for them. How awesome it is to know that the same love that sent Christ is also the love that fills us from God. The love that God has shown Christ may be in us just as Christ is in us. What does it mean to be so full of God's love that our cup runs over and overflows everybody else that we contact? Isn't that a missionary statement? Isn't that how we win people to Christ? Isn't that how we walk on mission with God? This prayer was his last prayer on earth in the guest chamber on the night before he was crucified. Jesus knew what he was about to endure. He knew what he was about to be suffering through. And yet, he had the presence of mind to pray for us here. He didn't focus on himself. He focused on God's love. And he focused on giving us God's love here today. There is sure a blessing when we receive salvation. 
but there's also a promise yet future. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast sent me, may be where I am, that they be behold my glory. What does it mean to behold the glory of the only begotten, Son of God, full of grace and truth? It means that we must be glorified as he is glorified to see his glory. In our sinful state, we cannot behold glory. I wish we could plumb the depths of this promise. But when we, can, when, when we look at what Paul had to suffer through and comparing the suffering that he endured against the glorification that God promises is yet future, that Jesus promised is yet future, we can see this compare and contrastion in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. But what things were gain unto me, those I counted lost for Christ. See, what we accomplish here on this earth, it means nothing. The degrees we get, the accolades we get, the awards we win, when we compare it to our glorification yet future, what is it worth? Verses 8, or 3, 8. Yet, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, but do count them as dung, that I may win Christ. What I do on this earth, it means nothing. Climbing the next step in the corporate ladder, it's dung. That we may win Christ. 3.9, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is God by faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. When we compare the things that we think will bring us joy against the resurrection of that day, it is worthless. In fact, it is filthy, it's disgusting, it is vile. We want nothing to do with it. I count it all as dung. My righteousness is as dung. Let that sink in for just a moment. <laughs> See, the, the, Solomon said it this way, vanity, vanity, all is vanity, and striving after the wind. Unless you're a glider pilot, the wind does nothing for you. <laughs> so why are we chasing after things of this world? Why are we chasing after things that won't glorify or edify? Why are we chasing after things that when God says, I will confess you before my Father if you confess me before men, why are we pursuing things that distract us from confessing Christ before people? When things look like they're going against us, rejoice. Remember, the night passes and brings on the morning. Death never comes in glory. Sickness, pain, sorrow cannot commingle with glory. How amazing and how awesome are the vows that Jesus made. And he shall do everything that proceedeth out of his mouth. Rest in his joy. This life is but a vapor, and the struggles and trials shall pass, and we have a promise that they shall return to glory. I return into rejoicing. Jesus vows it. Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest.
Do we believe it today? Do we believe in the promise of God today? Do we act like it? Let's go to the Father in prayer. Father, thank you for the words that you've given me. Thank you for your promises. Thank you that no matter what we must endure on this earth, that you're right here with us, that you vowed to save us and be with us and to comfort us, to resurrect us and reunite us with you in glory. Father, thank you for everything, all the blessings seen and unseen that you've given us. And I pray that your name be magnified and glorified this day and moving forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.